All right, all right, all right. All you data experts, I hope you're well warmed up in this rather cold room and are ready for another energetic session or two. I have some breaking news for you, by the way. Oh, I got your attention. That's good. Uh, the hashtag data15 is trending. Well, I don't know if you can say it's actually trending, but it's getting there. It's there are 500 uses. It's reached 5 million. So 200, uh, 200 people. Am I right? Marzio, Maurizio. Figures right? Where is he? We'll keep updating you as it goes. So keep those hashtags burning up. I think at this point it's also good to kind of recognize our um, really the the queen of UNICEF statistics, Tessa Wardlaw, who could not be here with us today. Uh, so we, we just want to recognize her enormous contribution to developing UNICEF into uh, the data knowledge source that we hope it is. So let me get right on to the next panel. We've had a really rich discussion this morning, a great breadth from everywhere from the Philippines to the district of District Columbia. Uh, we've spoken about how data can help even in the remotest areas. So we're now going to move right on to a, a much more uh, in-depth, weighty discussion that is going to be led by Jeffrey O'Malley, Director, Data Research and Policy at UNICEF, who's going to moderate this great panel this afternoon. So if you can one by one come up, Beth Novak, co-lead of the NYC Government Lab and former first deputy chief technology officer at the White House, Claire Melamud. Do we have Claire? No. So Priscilla Edela. I'm sorry. Apologies. I've I've jumped ahead. Sam Clark. Oh, we got two Clarks. That's good. Hope you got shoes on. Clark shoes. Sam Clark, Associate Professor, University of Washington, and Eduardo Clark, Director, Data Development Office of the President of Mexico. And we heard earlier how important that is to have, uh, to have the President's Office involved. And then we have Sarah Telford. So sorry, I had the next panel first. Okay, over to you, Jeff. Thanks, Sarah, and, and welcome back, everyone. Uh, we, we just had a, from uh, our crow uh, an update on our hashtag. Apparently 150 people were live streaming this morning as well. So uh, although I think probably lots of them are in time zones where if they're streaming at all now, they might be streaming from bed. But hello to uh, any of you who are live streaming the event. And we will have a, a recording as well for, for people to catch up afterwards. Um, so far this morning, just in terms of formats, of course, we started with some traditional speeches, and, and then we had our Ignite presentations. And, and now that it's after lunch, it's my turn to play Oprah Winfrey. So we, we, we have four guests. We, we don't have any Ignite presentations. We don't have any big speeches. Um, I'm, I'm really going to uh, really just try to have a bit of a, a chat show here. And, uh, and Sarah's going to liven things up um, by uh, wandering around and interrupting us on occasion. Um, I've got to disappoint you. There, there are no prizes for the audience. There are no big reveals like that. Um, we have no Justin Bieber haircuts up here. Um, the, uh, but nevertheless, I, I, I do hope this is a lively discussion. And uh, we, we have got a pigeonhole open. And so once again, you can start um, typing in your questions right now. And, and as in the last session, we'll start pulling out questions um, from the audience. So, so welcome uh, to uh, Beth and Sam and Eduardo and, and Sarah. Uh, Stefan finished the last session this morning um, by, by wrapping up and saying, the best data is data that's used. And uh, I think that's the perfect segue into our discussion this afternoon. Um, what have we learned, looking back in the MDG era, um, about analyzing and actually using data to help achieve the MDG results? And, and more importantly, how can we apply those lessons? What, what insights come from that that can guide us in the future? And it's a future that's not just building on lessons from the past, but it's a future that's embracing all of the new technologies we've, we've already started talking about today. Stefan also talked this morning 
um, about using umbrellas. <laughs> and uh, the fact that he's quite capable, although he's just a, a, a lowly international civil servant, even an international civil servant is able to combine different information sources. He can look at his phone for a, a weather forecast that comes from a sophisticate, sophisticated meteorological model, and he can look out the window and see how cloudy it is and combine those two sources of information to inform his decision about whether or not to use an umbrella. Um, and, and, and I loved that analogy because it, it brings us down to the real world. Uh, and, and in the real world, uh, virtually nobody, or maybe nobody at all, makes a decision only based on data. Sometimes you see phrases like data-based or evidence-based. I think at best we're talking about evidence or data-informed decision-making. Uh, decision-makers have to think about uh, politics. They have to think about opinions. They're shaped by their prejudices. They're shaped by how many cups of coffee they've had. Um, but what I, I think all of us can agree is that we would like decision-making that affects children uh, to be informed by data uh, as quickly and as powerfully as possible so that we can achieve the most powerful results as possible. So with that background, I, I'd like to start by asking maybe a, a general question for, for I'll, I'll go perhaps uh, guest by guest here. Looking back, looking based on your experience in, in, in your respective domains, and whether it's the humanitarian world or the government of Mexico or uh, as an academic or, or here domestically in the United States, um, can you each share one example from the past where you think there's been a really good system put in place to take data from its raw state through analysis into informing decisions? Um, so what, what's a good, powerful example um, that we could learn from um, before we start talking too much uh, about the future? And Eduardo, we, we heard uh, from you know, the ambassador, the deputy perm rep this morning about Mexico's experience. Could you build on that? What's a good uh, lesson from Mexico about moving that data from raw state into a decision? Of course. Well, thank you for the introduction. Uh, well, I think that it's a very long process that, that uh, I'd like to share, but one of the things that it's in one of the top priorities of my office is that the issue of maternal mortality in Mexico. As you all know, it's one of the MDGs, and it's one in which Mexico has been really struggling. And we've been trying to put in forward policy, but the rate of improvement is not as good as we want. So from my office and in collaboration with different stakeholders within the government, outside of the government, we started thinking, how can we leverage all the information systems that we have in Mexico to generate actionable policy-making recommendations that can actually impact this? So I'd like to speak a little bit about the kind of the infrastructure we have for data gathering and then moving on to the analysis. So we're fortunate enough in Mexico to have uh, a very autonomous uh, statistical office that generates very, very robust and very curated uh, data, uh, well, and the statistics. And we also have a lot of information generated directly from the public administration, that it's more of administrative records and so forth. So when we started looking at problems like this, we, we, we find a really a big wealth of data sources. The issue most of the time is how can we combine them and, and get people to work together on them. What happens sometimes is that people in the, the health ministry, for example, only see what they have in front of them because that's what they know. And, and people in other dependencies, that's what they have in front of them. So what we try to act as, as the office of the president is kind of being uh, a funnel and trying to do a bit of data matchmaking but finding all the different data sources from different parts of government and putting them together to get, uh, to get some work done. And one of the parts I would really like to emphasize is that sometimes all this evidence-based pol uh, policy making or data analysis projects for informing policy, uh, they're, they're kind of close. You know, maybe uh, myself within the office, I would be doing something. What we have learned uh, to working there is trying to open it up and trying to get people from the outside to participate with us. So what we did for the topic of maternal mortality, we, we started looking at data sources, and then we started finding expert, experts from outside of government to help us build, uh, build a concrete project and start looking at alternatives. One of the issues that we had in Mexico is that all the, all the, a lot of the research before was done at the municipality level, at the national level, state trends, 
uh, from one side, and the other side were doctors and physicians doing everything at a very much clinical case basis, kind of what doctors do, looking at a particular case. So what we tried to do was try to uh, merge those two approaches and do something concrete. For this, we worked with the University of Chicago with the Data Science for Social Good project. And what we told them is, we have a lot of data. We, we generate uh, birth registries, uh, the patient discharges, uh, death registries, everything at the individual level. How can we help you get this into a very concrete database and start working together? And what we did there was trying to go further and trying to generate some basic recommendations for the Ministry of Health to follow. And, and one of the big lessons that we have is that a lot of what we found is kind of common sense. Things like uh, increasing the amount of consultations that people in marginalized areas have during their pregnancy. Or, uh, or reducing the, the, the distance that they have to travel to, to, uh, to give birth. What was important and, and what is crucial in this case is, is putting a number to each of the recommendations that you find. Because some of the times, well, they're, they're common sense and they know that they have to do stuff, stuff like this, but putting a number to them and showing the policymakers at the Ministry of Health just how much they can improve with a concrete, uh, with a concrete change really makes a world of difference by them internalizing it and going forward with it. Great. Th thanks, Eduardo. And I, I think that it's a great example. And as uh, your, your compatriot said this morning, it's, it's an unusual model, having your office in the presidency and this ability, in a sense, to be above line ministries and, and to work with line ministries. And I, I, hopefully we can hear from the audience more about opportunities and challenges when a, a statistics office doesn't have that kind of political um, visibility and, and supra-ministerial role. I, I could imagine it's more challenging. But let me turn to Sarah, if I can, um, right now. We heard a bit about humanitarian um, issues this morning, but not a lot. And in, in terms of translating data into decisions, in an emergency, that needs to happen right now. So do you have a good example of, of a, a system or a place uh, that's really doing a good job of gathering humanitarian data and really using it to guide action. Sure, so I, I was thinking of the analogy of looking out at the weather versus looking at a device, and I think humanitarian data is much more looking out at the weather um, and kind of feeling what is happening in a response rather than really having a ton of data to help with decisions. But I think that's changing. Um, I run the Humanitarian Data Exchange platform. We've been around for about a year. And just to context, like we sort of think of humanitarian data as the development data, the baseline data, geospatial data, um, and then data about the, the actual crisis. So the people affected, where they are, what they need, and then the response, who's responding, what are they, what are they providing. So within that, one, one really important data set is who's doing what where. So um, it's called the 3W data set. And I think that's probably one of the most active contributed data set in most crises, you can get a, you know, you can kind of understand who's doing what where. The, four, the fourth W of, um, of, you know, for what period uh, doesn't always come in, and also for whom, you know, and how that is um, kind of changing over time. But what, what I've seen, and I've been in, in this space for maybe 10 years, is that it used to be very manual. You'd be collecting the data, putting it into, into a spreadsheet. Um, OCHA in our coordination role would send out a standard template, get all that data back through emails, a lot of cutting and pasting, and then maybe you'd have a static uh, PDF map. And so now I think it's much, it's the, the, the process is speeding up. There's a lot more efficiency in terms of how the data is collected, and now it's maybe done through Google Spreadsheets. Um, there's uh, automated validation processes that we're introducing, and then that's linked directly to interactive uh, 3W visuals that you can find on the HDX site and other places. So I think over time that'll even get better. Maybe there'll, there'll be um, a time dimension to it so that you can see how who's doing what where has changed from the beginning of the crisis to the end of the crisis. Um, so that's an example. Can, do you, are those data used well? You know, well, the, the one, one thing yeah. both you and Edward have been talking about is sort of getting the data you need and, and packaging it. Yeah but actually using those data to make an informed decision. Uh, what, do you have an example of, of where that works well? 
Yeah, I mean, just in terms of user statistics on the HDX site for the Nepal earthquake, we set up a crisis page, so it sort of had the top line figures, it had an interactive um, map, it had, I think, about 82 data sets contributed from different organizations responding. The top download for that crisis was, was the 3W, well, actually, after the number of people who'd, who'd been killed and injured. The top lap download was was the 3W data set. So how it was used in practice, I mean, I wasn't in Nepal, I didn't, I didn't deploy, but my sense is that uh, it was very valuable to the decision makers there that they did use it to help them understand what areas weren't being covered and what were. Great. Beth, you come from uh, the United States and you've worked in a domestic... Brooklyn, I come from Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so near almost the United kind, States. Kind of related country. Uh, <laughs> And uh, yeah, the People's Republic of Brooklyn exactly. and the um, <laughs> Park Slope, no. <laughs> the, um, but um, you've worked in, in, a, in a domestic environment in a rich country, um, and including public policy space. So do you, do you have an example here domestically of um, whether data is being used well to guide decisions? So it's int I think, you know, the question itself belies the answer, which is that we're at the moment of this transition from the world of decision-based evidence to evidence-based decision-making. So we've been collecting, publishing a lot of data in many contexts. We have had a so-called chief statistician of the United States for I don't know how long. I bet you didn't even know that and probably surely do not know this person's name, but you probably know that this year President Obama appointed a chief data officer of the United States, uh, DJ Patil, and there has been a move now to go past the world of collecting data for perfunctory purposes to using that data and transitioning into making use of it to govern differently and do things differently. And I think that's a phenomenon that exists in the United States, but all around the world as governments and other entities begin to um, develop the tools, develop the capacity uh, to not only collect data, but to, tr to, to use it to develop better insight and develop better decision making. So a couple of examples maybe. Um, so in the, to take a domestic example per your request, um, there is a group based here in New York City, uh, it's an offshoot of the Annie E. Casey Foundation from Baltimore um, called Casebook that some of you may have come across, and I don't know if anybody from Casebook is in the room, but what Casebook does is to develop um, technology systems for child welfare. They have deployed their system in the Annie E. Casey regional sort of private uh, um, child services offices, but now also with the state of Indiana. What the tool is, it's Casebook, it's Facebook, but for caseworkers working with children. And what it does is it puts the child at the center, and it allows all the care providers, doctors, social workers, et cetera, to enter data about the child in one place and to have it visible with the right permissions to all the people who need to have access to that data. What's important about this is not just having data and having data in one place, but the fact that now, after just a little more than a year of use, um, there at, and the availability of real-time analytics back to caseworkers who are working with children, that they have the ability, at least in the first instance, some of the early data shows that they have been able to dramatically reduce uh, the a number of short stays in foster care. In other words, kids shuttling from one foster home to another, they've been able to dramatically reduce that rate and improve the lives of children and hopefully the quality of care as a result of providing data back to people to use it differently. So the availability of data by itself is never enough. It's how it gets used and how it gets incorporated into decision making, which can often be a very big cultural transition as much as it is a technological one. Great. Sam, our academic on the panel, <laughs> You've, I, I was just saying to Sam before the panel started, I, I heard him speak at the Cartagena Data Festival earlier this year and, and talk about his academic work um, looking at triangulation, bring, putting together different data sources, but it, which builds a bit on Eduardo. But before getting into that, from your, your research, do you have a good example of um, you know, this translation of the findings of data into analysis into actual policy decisions? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I work in South Africa with the School of Public Health at the University of Witwatersrand, and we have a very uh, simple project that we've um, been working on for quite a while, and that is uh, hypertension. So we have data from administrative sources and uh, lots of household surveys that do biomarkers and so on that indicate that in South Africa there's a significant um, hypertension epidemic, and we know from all kinds of other data sources 
uh, around the world that salt is a major risk factor. And then further, we have some data from bakeries, uh, both interviews with uh, the cooks and testing of the, the baked goods, mainly bread, that there's about four times as much salt in South African bread as in most other places. So a very simple uh, policy intervention materialized, and that is we need to regulate bakeries to reduce the salt content of the bread. And um, then we engaged quite a large team for a long period of time. So in this case, the data was very simple, and it was, it was there already. Uh, what was very difficult was influencing the government to A, take this seriously, and then B, do something about it. And we actually got it all the way through to an act of parliament that now uh, mandates the reduction of salt content in bread. Very simple, and it should be very uh, effective in terms of um, reducing morbidity, strokes, and things like that, and actually saving lives. Great. It, it's interesting already the range of examples where, uh, if I understand, Sam, it sounds like an academic NGO coalition, yeah. perhaps outside government, mm -hmm. interpreting data, doing advocacy to influence policy right. successfully. Eduardo's at the heart of government um, and, and facilitating government decision making. You know, Sarah's talking about uh, you know, a range of actors working with governments in, in a response to an emergency. And, and you know, the example we heard from Beth was an example of, of data influencing frontline um, action, if I understood correctly. It's service providers who are doing a better job um, due to data sources coming together and having those real-time analytics. Let, let's think a bit more about the future and um, you know, what opportunities are emerging uh, and what, what we should be prioritizing. Uh, certainly for UNICEF, uh, as well as I think for, for other, what we, we call in, in this, this world, development partners. So the people who are involved as international development NGOs or as, as multilateral organizations, you know, we all have limited resources of funds. Some of us have a bit of that to invest in data. One of our questions is how, how much do we invest in, in the collection how much do we invest in the analysis? How much do we invest in things like data literacy and data use and advocacy so that decision makers are aware of data? And, and uh, within our own organizations, it is a bit of a zero-sum game. You know, we have, we have fixed budgets and, and we have to figure out the right balance. Um, do, do any of you have a sense, um, any, any advice for UNICEF or advice for other development partners on, uh, you know, should we be focusing more on that literacy and use end? Uh, is that something that can take care of itself as long as the data systems are in place? Any thoughts on that? Beth? So, um, too, many, too many thoughts in too, too short a time. Um, so let me try to address a couple of these. Um, first, to the point about data literacy and data skills. I think one of the things that's important and one of the places that we tend to not think about, we tend to separate thinking about data and big data from thinking about human intelligence. But in fact, a lot of these data science tools, what they're very good for is helping us to understand better what people's skills and abilities are. So the investment in data science tools to allow us to know who within an organization or the ecosystem of collaborating organizations has which skills is tremendously important. Because you may discover that although there are a handful of people whose title is statistician, or, uh, or who have data in their title, there may be distributed throughout the organization people who do have statistical literacy, who have taken a course on Coursera in data science or data analytics, or people who have an interest in developing those skill sets distributed across the organization. So there are organizations like the World Bank, for example, which rolled out a project called Skill Finder last year, originally designed to help people within the bank identify what people know in order to find peer reviewers for projects. What it's turning out to be very useful for is helping frontline managers know what the skills are of people in their own teams in order to do exactly this, reach out, find distributed expertise that may exist not in the teams in which people are working or the silos in which people are already operating, but to look across the organization to find people who may have the ability to visualize a data set know better how to crowdsource data, know how to do many of the things that we need to do. So I think one of the first recommendations I have would be to use data itself and data science in order to understand better what the human capital is in order to know where there may be resources that could be deployed if in the organization. We can do the same thing also to look outside the organization combined with crowdsourcing and other challenges which UNICEF has been good at 
um, is reaching outside organizations to bring in capacity from outside. There are plenty of people working in industry and academia and elsewhere who would gladly lend their time and their talent. So if, and if I have time, I will give one additional recommendation. So I think one is the focus on, uh, on skills and data about skills. I think the second is um, that we have to focus on the range of the ecosystem of data collection and use, which has already been said. There's a lot of discussion about pushing data out. Um, we are talking more and we'll talk more about how do we get data back in in order to inform what we do, but we tend to always talk about data for about children or data about the relevant populations. We're not talking about collecting data from children and with children and with the engagement of children. So I want to point out the robust citizen science movement, which is increasingly engaging young people to develop their STEM education skills, but also to gather data on the ground about the conditions that that surround people. So it's not just studying children, um, it's actually engaging them in the process of gathering data about their own schools, about their own communities, about their own air and water quality. Yesterday at NYU we had a speech from Samir Brahmachari, who's the former head of science for India and the founder of something called Open Source Drug Discovery. Open Source Drug Discovery, for those who don't know, is a project that uses students, not a, not people, nobody older than 25 with the exception of a few people, so largely children who are engaged in the process of annotating the entire genomic literature on tuberculosis. Long story short, 50 years, no advances in tuberculosis, drugs, or treatment. This project, a distributed group of students, have started clinical trials on the first new tuberculosis drug in 50 years. So we shouldn't underestimate the ability of children to be participants in the process, not only subjects of the process. Thanks, Beth. And just so you know, because I know you couldn't be with us this morning, but in data from children very much has come up okay. today already and will come up again later. So it's on the agenda here. Eduardo, just on this issue, and then I, I, I think we, we need to open it up a little bit and, and get into some more specific questions. But you're, uh, again, in a government. Um, Beth started talking about, again, more uh, on the push side. You know, as a, a government that cooperates with agencies like UNICEF and, and UNSD and, and NGOs and so on, what would you look to from us in, in terms of working along that data continuum? How important do you think our role is in supporting use as opposed to collection or something in between? Well, I think one of the biggest challenges uh, I face almost daily is trying to convince people in different government agencies within Mexico that data can be useful for their daily work. So sometimes they, people in government, they collect a lot of data, they generate data every day, but they see it more as a, a kind of a track of their work rather than a tool for their future work. And one of the things that, that we try to work hard with them is try to pair them up with people from the outside that can help them with the problems that they face daily using the data they generate daily and data from other sources. So what, what, the way that we work right now is trying to find concrete problems in different government agencies. They can be widespread topics from uh, the Mexican Electricity Commission all the way to uh, the Ministry of Agriculture and try to match them with experts from the outside that have, a, have an idea of a very concrete case use to help solve a, uh, a joint problem between the government agency and the people from the outside. I think for all the topics related to children and uh, and access to to rights for children in Mexico, UNICEF can be a, a crucial partner with us because they have the expertise from the outside and they can leverage the tools that we as government have to make concrete projects with the aim of, of solving a, a joint issue. On the same topic, we're working with Mexico's UNICEF represent, uh, representation on the topic of access of, to health services for pregnant women in some of Mexico's most marginalized communities. and. Uh, and using Rapid Pro, I, I'm sure everybody has heard of it right now, uh, we're trying to get data back from the women that we provide service to and generate actionable policy uh, for the health ministry. So just to make a concrete example, one of the big things that we see is that we as a government, it's hard for us to make decisions on the quality of health service that we provide in very marginalized communities. So the work with UNICEF is how can we get the information directly from the users so that we as government can make better decisions of where to put our priorities in improving uh, quality of service. Great, thanks Edward. I'm gonna come back to triangulation, but can we see some of, uh, I assume that some of you have been uh, pigeonholing away. Uh, we have a few questions up here. Um, 
And let me just uh, be democratic and take uh, the top left, 11 votes. Mm. Uh, we usually collect data from the field upwards, sometimes analyze it, but very rarely share it back with the field for local use and decision. Wouldn't those feedback loops be our best next move? Any thoughts on that from our panel? Yes. Sarah? Uh, sure. I mean, I know um, this is a huge issue in the humanitarian community. How do we engage affected people? And um, one, I think, pilot that just happened in Nepal was with Ground Truth and a couple other organizations where they did surveys with affected people and created um, statistics and, and data out of that and really found that I think, you know, much more than, I forget the exact number, maybe 60 or 70 percent, you know, we're not happy with the response. And, and some of their key concerns were about where to find certain things, and, and they weren't getting the communication uh, that, to help them make those decisions. So this is critical, and I know in our sector the communications with communities, or um, it's changing its name all the time, but is a, is a huge uh, priority. Can we see some more questions here, please? I've, we've lost the field of questions. There we go. Um, the, um, very, I'm going to take the, this third one here uh, with four votes, but in, in terms of the theme of the panel, uh, what do we know? Do we have any study or estimate? Do we have any data about what proportion of the data we generate is actually used for action and what is collected uh, for nothing? Um, I, I, my guess is, is nobody does a report saying I've collected 70% of these statistics for nothing, <laughs> but um, let's interpret this question loosely. <laughs> um, but again, uh, Sam, maybe I, I wonder whether you have some sense of, of, you know, of the investment in data. Do you have some sense of how much actually leads to action and how much is kind of just there? Um, I have a gut feeling from my own experience doing um, a lot of academic work and I, I feel that the real issue is we collect a lot of data for nothing, just as this question says. Uh, maybe we do huge surveys where we collect 400, 500 variables, and then we, we really analyze about 25 of them well, and then we put it out there and we hope that somebody else is going to analyze the rest. And so one of the things I wanted to maybe um, mention later in this discussion is I think the real emphasis needs to be more on the whole utilization pipeline from you know, what, what do we do with it, um, how do we triangulate and harmonize and integrate, and um, how do we develop new methods to get more out of those um, data sources and out of even individual sources, and then how do we make sure that the right people are able to digest what we produce. And I think that's all of those stages are places where we fall down. Um, so if I, were, if I were the data god and got to allocate resources, I would allocate most of them toward um, using the data that we do collect uh, much, much better than we, than we are at the moment. Greg, can you elaborate a little more on that and just, uh, not just where you'd allocate the resources, but uh, concretely, what would you recommend in terms of the, the nature of, um, of the actions you'd like to support? So I think the, I think the, the with all of the data that we're talking about, the, the devil is really in the details of what you do with it. And so I think that um, my primary concern as we talk about the data revolution and all these nice things we want to do is who's going to do it, exactly who is going to actually do the detailed work that's, that's required to use data. And I think there's, there's different ways it gets used. Sometimes it just gets pumped out and it's kind of uh, very uh, brief summaries, percentages and things. But if you want to go beyond that, you actually have to think very carefully about the statistical design that generated the data or the lack thereof. Um, and how you're going to attempt to harmonize or merge those data sources, and then what does it actually mean? And that might be pretty sophisticated, and uh, not very many people are going to be engaged with that. But then um, much more people, many more people would be involved in interpreting the results of that kind of thing. So I think that we need data literacy kind of at the last stage on a very wide scale basis. Um, and in the middle, we need to support uh, the development of the new methods that are required to actually make all of these fancy uses of the data sources that we have. So kind of a multi-level um, training agenda, uh, some emphasis on, on a very sophisticated level, um, and, a, and a much bigger emphasis, I think, on just basic data literacy. How do we interpret data, and then how do we translate um, that interpretation into something useful? 
So training, I think I'm really talking about training and, um, and kind of hands-on mentoring and uh, internship kind of things where we uh, begin developing all of that. And I, you know, obviously in the academic setting, I, this is what I spend about half my time on. And I see the young kids that we spoke about this morning who are you know, accustomed to using data, but they've never had any training in terms of what data are, what they mean. And um, you know, they kind of treat everything equally. They can't di differentiate what is actually meaningful information coming in and what's not. And then you find that, um, yeah, you, they, have, they have to go through quite a bit before they're able to, to do that, uh, even though they're very used to working with data and the concept. So uh, this issue came up this morning as well, that different data are good for different purposes. Yeah. Now, both you and Eduardo have talked about triangulation, merging, getting data sets to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. um, but Eduardo also talked about the hardest thing is convincing people that data is not just for monitoring, but something that can actually inform what they do next. Um, and I, I think something we, those of us who work in development have, have, have kind of always known, even if we have to relearn it, is that if somebody does it for you, you don't own it. Mm. You've got to do it yourself to some degree um, if you're going to internalize it and own it. But we're not going to turn, I'm not a statistician, and we're not going to turn a bunch of decision makers into uh, statisticians. So I, I think we've got a challenge here in balancing mm. um, it, it, the, you know, how much can we expect people to do themselves? Uh, and really own it, and how much does it need to be done for you? Beth, do you, do you have a sense from your work uh, about how to address this? Well, I think one of the things that we've seen with the availability of more data and with the launch of policies of open data that have made a million government data sets from dozens of countries newly available is that the value of open data as opposed to just available data is that it allows third parties with the interest and the passion and the skills to use the data even when the data owners can't. So take for example, um, you know, and that, and that holds the promise that as the cost and of the tools come down and as the um, uh, uh, distribution of skills as more people learn data literacy skills. We just ran, my colleagues ran a summer camp for 12 year olds to teach them data skills uh, this summer and there's going to be lots of more things like this. Um, you're going to get the third parties who come and grab the data set that's of interest and that they're passionate about. Um, so there's a, the potential for that kind of long tail of data. So surely there are data sets where we have to invest a lot in making the liter legibility of that data, the usefulness of that data uh, um, more visible to people because it's of great interest to a lot of people. But there are also data sets and problems and questions that are going to be equally important and of interest to smaller numbers of people where those passionate people are going to run with it. So I'm, you know, just take for example in Tanzania, uh, um, there is a two da dashboards that have been created, one called Education Dashboard, not surprising, it's somewhat, somewhat obvious what that does. Um, but dissatisfied with education dashboard, which is what the government created to actually make schools uh, examination pass rates across schools um, more available and accessible to parents and students and, and communities in Tanzania, a single individual named Arnold Minda decided he was going to make a better dashboard that actually had visualizations and comparative data. Um, internet penetration rates in Tanzania are very low. Are a lot of people reading it? Are many, many people using it? Uh, probably not yet. But you can see from this dashboard that there are schools that are scoring 100% pass rates on examination compared to schools that have 7% pass rates. And it allows those people with the passion and the interest and the concern to then have the information that they need to get mobilized and to arm themselves to do something differently than they did before. So I think if we move from thinking about a kind of mass-based perception to a long tail perception, and embrace the fact that it's not going to be the data owners who are often the most uh, uh, avid users of the data or the ones best able to make sense of it, um, there's a lot of hope. I think we all want the next step to happen, which is the data owners themselves to become more literate and to be able to make decisions and do things differently. But it's going to simply become a more collaborative ecosystem that isn't limited to the people working inside one organization or bureaucracy. So Jeff, while we see the top question on the left is trending about citizen-generated data. We have a real person in the audience who wants to ask a quick question. Oh, there it is. <laughs> thank, thank you very much for the, uh, the presenters. Um, 
It's good that you're talking about uh, uh, data use, but and there's a little bit of reference to data utilization. And I would like if you can, I wonder if you can comment about the issue of data utilization from the perspective of, of decision making and accountability. And the reason I'm saying that is because very often what you find is the data is being produced but it's not being utilized at the level at which the decisions are taking place. I can give you an example of the case of Nepal. Most of the decision is taking place at the district level. Is the data being produced at the district level? Yes or not? A DHS is, or a mix is a, is a good response to the needs, um, uh, often at the level of the government, but it's mostly at the global level, the, the request of this type of data. So my question is, is, are, is the data being produced and utilized at the level at which it should be used? Because if we don't, if we don't produce the elements for the decision making, we cannot uh, hold uh, the decision makers accountable to the decision that they're making. Okay, we, we did hear a little bit about that from Eduardo earlier and the challenge of that. Does anyone want to add to I Sarah? Say, um, I think this has been the big challenge with some of the work that we're doing. And I noticed last year we were working on the Ebola response and we were getting a lot of data sets in. And I th I, I'm not a statistician or a data scientist either. But, um, I'm a consumer of data, and I come from a product background. So I saw all this data coming in, and I thought, anyone that's not technical coming to the site isn't going to understand any of this. So we built an interactive kind of product layer on top of the data so that people could see it much easier. Um, so, so the point there is that I think it, any open data initiative, there's an obligation to make the data more accessible to users. Uh, one example, and I think you do that through data visualizations and um, so that people can interact and see it and, and it's obvious. Uh, one example, we're working in Guinea right now with the uh, infection prevention and control cluster. And so they're um, collecting data from 20 different organizations on training of healthcare workers in Ebola treatment centers. And they've had the hardest time just getting little bits of data from these organizations on who's been trained and where. And we got involved um, with USAID and um, the OCHA office there and the government and started to piece this together and start building some visuals on top of it. And it changed everything. People could start to see where there were gaps. Um, they felt left out because they weren't part of the, the picture that was being presented to the head of the cluster, a man named Dr. Conte. And now, just yesterday, we got um, you know new data in from a couple of new organizations. So. My sense is that it has to be accessible and you have to um, make it pretty for people to really engage. Great. I, I think this, this um, first uh, question, uh, or the, the most voted question here, and, and in many ways Beth was already talking about that uh, in terms of, of data holding government to account, whether that's a, a single person in Tanzania um, you know, making the data about school performance available or, or whatever the example is. Um, I wonder if we can go back uh, before we run out of time to a little bit of this issue of triangulation. Again, references this morning and at the panel now to bringing together different data sets, yet also a, a lot of warnings this morning that, you know, we have different, as Attila said, different data are collected and, and they have qualities that they, they make them appropriate for different reasons. Tony, in his opening speech, said real-time data might be good enough to you know, make a quick adjustment, but you don't want to base a policy or an investment on that. And while robust data from a household survey or a census might drive a strategy or a policy, but it's not quick enough to you know, adjust things on the go. So where's the potential and where's the limitation in terms of getting data sets to speak to each other and, and having new insights in the future. Let me start with Sam, because I know you've done so much work in this area. So I think the, um, the limitations are, are the most obvious thing, and they're kind of related to what you just mentioned, the fact that the data are generated by different uh, statistical designs, so they fundamentally mean different things and represent different populations, and on different uh, temporal frequencies. So some are very long gaps and some are very frequent, and then also different spatial granularities. So the, the challenges are pretty significant. So I think you need to have a clear goal in mind what you're uh, attempting to get out of this. 
And then in our experience, the, um, there's several ways to go about it. One can uh, use some kind of uh, imputation and merging, which involves making lots of assumptions about what the missing data would look like and then essentially making them up so that you can put two data sets together. Um, another approach is to produce a kind of intermediate indicator uh, that's well characterized in all of these data sources and then use a modeling approach or an ensemble approach like um, uh, Matthew was talking about this morning to put those together and those are much more comparable quantities uh, that can then be um, interpreted together. So we're, the example that we've been working on is, is child mortality in Tanzania and putting together all of the DHS surveys there uh, and the information from uh, continuous uh, health and demographic surveillance system um, where you have much smaller populations but much, much more accurate and much, much more frequently measured. Um, so then we, we've built a spatial temporal model where we have uh, child mortality in terms of um, under five mortality rates with good confidence intervals. And I see one of these questions here is about data quality. That's a, that's a key issue because each of the sources come with different quality issues, bias or uh, variance issues. So you need to take those into account when you're putting things together. Uh, but then it's very possible to build a model where you can um, incorporate everything and borrow uh, essentially use the different sources to provide additional strength to each other and fill in the gaps where you don't have anything in a reasonable um, way. Uh, the problem is, is that it just takes a lot of thought and given the heterogeneity of these data sources, it's kind of an idiosyncratic process where each time you approach it, you're going to probably maybe engage a framework, but then the details are going to be um, different for, for each of them. So I think it's, um, it's something uh, that's going to become much more uh, tempting and necessary as we bring in all of these new data sources and it's not something that we've done a heck of a lot of work on as a from a kind of theoretical point of view. Well, there's lots of ad hoc attempts to do this and they often kind of brush under the carpet things like uh, well one data source is very uncertain and the other's very certain and we just kind of put them together and assume they're the same but um, can't really do that. Okay, good word of warning, although I... So, uh, the, so the opportunities, are, I, I think, are also um, are obvious. You get things that you just didn't have before. You have synergies um, that allow you to do things um, that you can, just can't do with any of the, in, the sources individually. So in this Tanzania example, uh, the DHS, uh, and it's interesting, both MIX and DHS are similar. They're really designed to produce nationally representative numbers. But like this gentleman was just saying, the decisions are really at a smaller or a, a less aggregated uh, level of government, so often districts or provinces. And those uh, surveys don't actually produce numbers routinely that relate to that level of government. So, so word uh, of warning, if I may interrupt, we have one more question before, as we wind down, one more question and then back to the panel. Just a quick question here. So, did if, I interrupt did, yeah, you? Yeah, you just I'm cut so Sam sorry. off just before, if you, if you could finish that, please. <laughs> Here's your point he's gonna make. So one of the things that you can get from this kind of triangulation is numbers at that kind of level that you just didn't have uh, before. And those, I think, are particularly useful. And I think Sarah just said that's your last point, so yes. thank you. <laughs> We're done with that. Sorry, sorry for the rudeness, I have to watch no. the time. Very quick question from here, and then we'll start wrapping up for the next session. Oh, I, I don't actually have a question. I actually wanted to try to answer his question, because I don't, I don't think that we did answer his question. No. The answer to his question isn't about technology. It isn't about the metadata. It isn't about joining them or interfaces. It's about culture. We have to insist, I think, that our leaders have a culture of using data for decisions. And that culture doesn't exist today. We give them a pass. We tell them, you don't need to know about data. You don't need to know about IT because we have experts who will tell you about data and IT. And I just don't think in 2015 that we can run organizations any longer where we don't expect our leaders to know about how to use information for decisions. I think it's cultural, and we have to, I think it's up to us to insist that leadership today is well informed about how to use technology to make the right decisions. And we're talking in particular about governments here, uh, and I, I'm sure that this cultural problem resonates across the panel, although I don't know if how many people are in a position to tell governments that to insist <laughs> anything to their governments. It depends on how uh, responsive the government is. Look, we've just got five minutes left. It's about one minute each. Let's focus on that final issue of use um, and, and really just the last thought from each of you. You know, one key take-home message 
um, in terms of moving towards both the analysis and, and skills that are needed, the systems that are needed for better data use, or the culture, uh, the politics for better data use. Beth, let me start with you and just go across. Oh, the last minute. Uh, so, yeah, so absolutely to that final point, and it has so many interlocking uh, reasons that this exists because of the way that we train the people who are our leaders for the most part, whether it's politicians or administrators in NGOs or in governments. Uh, if you look at the way that we are educated, particularly in this country, um, where we are a culture run by lawyers <laughs> and public and people who are trained in things like public policy schools, but above all, what we are is working in closed door institutions um, where we have learned to develop a certain kind of smug self-sufficiency in our own intelligence and in our own decision-making ability. It made a lot of sense in the 20th century when our goal was to avoid undue influence and corruption to try to shield our decision makers from the outside influences that might corrupt them. But we know in the 21st century in a world of open data and crowdsourcing and collaboration that particularly in these contexts where we lack those skill sets, we have to actually begin to work to get, we have to educate ourselves in new ways, we have to work with people who have a different skill set than we do, who are smarter than we do to work differently and to make decisions differently. And we can not anymore hide behind that uh, justification that somehow it is okay to close our doors and to make decisions with the absence of both data and data intelligence, but also human intelligence and collaboration that would allow us to gain those better insights. So here, here to the point about culture, supported by law, supported by philosophy, supported by technical systems that have um, left us behind in our institutions. Thanks, Beth. Sam. Right, and one of our institutions is, um, is higher education, and we require our students in um, four-year institutions to do math, to do some form of um, humanities and things like that. Usually some form of science, but it almost never includes data science specifically. And so um, I'm, I'm with some colleagues at the University of Washington now trying to argue that we make a mandatory class for our undergraduates that's basic data literacy. So it's a little bit of IT, a little bit of information science, enough math to, to understand those basic things, and that everybody should just take it. It's something we all have to do, just like literature and the other things that we force them to do. Eduardo, you're in the real world. Um, <laughs> real world recommendations so that data is used to drive results for children. Speaking from the other side, being, of course, not very lucky enough to have very technical bosses and that understand all of the different and hard modeling that sometimes goes through data science or data analysis. So from my side, I think the hardest part has been learning how to talk to decision makers and some of the time you spend more time socializing your results than actually uh, finding them. <laughs> so one of the parts that is really important is how can you constrain the problem that you're trying to solve so that the recommendations that you find are within the political scope of what can be achieved through your bosses and also how to tell them exactly at walk them through the procedures that you've done so that they understand where it's coming from and the importance of it. Sometimes just going there and blabbling numbers and uh, the results of models is not gonna get you anywhere. You have to think how they think and frame everything as a socializing procedure of getting them to understand what we're doing. Thanks so much, and Sarah. Um, so I think it, our priority is really there's three that I'm working on, data policy. We don't really have a data humanitarian data policy framework and we've been working with the GovLab and Leiden and, and so many others to try and think through responsible use of data in the humanitarian space. The other is data literacy, of course. It's a huge issue. Most humanitarian workers have a um, social sciences background. They're not um, numbers um, driven or, or used to working with numbers. And then the third, I think, is, is for the people working in the humanitarian space and development space to be more open by default with the data that they generate. Um, you know, it's publicly funded, and I think there should be more transparency. Um, and so creating incentives for them to, to feel comfortable around sharing data. Great. And I'm not going to try to wrap up everything, partly because I've got a minute and 14 seconds left, uh, partly because you all wrapped up so well. But just two take-homes from me. One was that gut instinct that a large part of the data that is collected and analyzed probably isn't used for anything in terms of driving results. And so when we talk about tensions in, in budgets and prioritization and time, surely one of the things we have to look at is making sure that we're collecting data which responds to real policy needs rather than investing uh, in, in data or indeed in analysis and reports and so on that won't drive policy. And, and a second, uh, I just want to 
echo uh, that last point by Eduardo that, that the, you know, investing in, in socializing data, to use that word, to, in, in, in that translation of data uh, into a form that it can be used. Um, I'm not 100% with the culture person, just because I'm not a data person, and I think sometimes it's not culture, it's, it's not understanding. And, and I think the people who understand data have to try to understand that decision makers don't always understand data, and they have to put some investment into making that translation. So with that, um, we're going to transition into capacity development, which uh, is going to be even harder. So thanks to the panel, and I think we're on to our next one.